It's being 2 p.m. in accordance with Standing Order 43. The time for members' statements has concluded. The acting Prime Minister on uh, ministerial Speaker, arrangements. The, as the assistant treasurer and minister for small business will be away from question time today as she's unwell. The Treasurer will answer questions on her behalf. I thank the Acting Prime Minister. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The member for Sydney. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Yesterday, the Prime Minister failed to mention the government's woefully inadequate 26 to 28 per cent carbon pollution target even once in his speech to the Climate Members Conference on in Paris. Is the government leaving room for a more ambitious target? Or, like the Foreign Minister, is the government saying one thing in the conference room in Paris and another thing entirely in the party room in Canberra? Yeah, yeah. The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr Speaker, I thank the member for her question. And the government announced its targets for the Paris conference last August. Publicly, there were press releases. It was, in fact, lodged with the UN. It's a 26 to 28 per cent reduction on 2005 levels by 2030. And the target has been the subject of many Member public announcements and statements. It's the same policy that we've had since August. But I, I really do question left. the deputy leader of the opposition uh, seeking to make something of what is a public announcement by us and suggesting that we say one thing in Paris and another in Canberra. But the deputy leader does have form on this, you see. She so often says things that really are subject to some um, detailed consideration. Um, dare I say she's been scaremongering again on the oh. issue of climate change. Now, Mr Speaker, um, I, don't, I think it's important not Rankin. to engage in hyperbole when one is talking about climate change. I remember in 2011 when Member the Deputy Leader Rankin. tried to scare the senior citizens on the, coast, on the central coast by saying they were going to be subject to the ravages of climate change. Well, this is rather interesting. On the 4th of November, in relation to climate change, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said on radio, said on radio ABC that she had visited the Pacific Islands and, quote, she went to see, well, where an island used to be, the island of Aneko, an island that had a home on it, a garden spread fruit trees, palm trees, it's just literally disappeared into the sea, she said, literally disappeared into the sea. So that was news to me, that was certainly news to the Post, that was certainly news to the residents of Aneko. Uh, colleagues might be interested to see the island of Aneko. <laughs> the Minister for Foreign Affairs knows and the when, rules of our when crops. When, uh, I seek to table a picture of Aneko. You don't need leave to table. And indeed, Aneko, the island that she says has Members on my literally right. disappeared into the sea, has in fact got a residence on it. It's got, it's got um, a beautiful Member and accessible for beach getaway. You can rent a bungalow for fifty dollars a night. It's in good condition, we're told. There are houses, lawns, Member gardens. For Barker. There's a toilet block. And there are picnic tables. So it seems to me that when the deputy leader of the opposition makes a claim, people had better test it very carefully. Scaremongering, <coughs> exaggerating, hyperbole, and that's really news to the people of Annette. The minister's time has expired. <laughs> the member for Page will resume his seat. The member for Sydney, member for Sydney will resume her seat just for a second. The member for Deakin will cease interjecting. The in, there are far too many interjections on each side. The member for Deakin will cease interjecting. The member for Bass will cease interjecting. On my left, the uh, members for Jagger, Jagger and Hotham will cease interjecting. Uh, I warned them yesterday. And the member for Hunter as well has given me a private assurance. The member for Sydney. Speaker, I, I seek leave to table the speech by the granted. Prime Minister in Paris where he doesn't mention He's leave, the pathetic leave's not targets granted. I call the, the member for Page. Thank you, member Mr. For Speaker. Page has the call. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Will the Acting Prime Minister please update the House on infrastructure projects that are currently underway in my electorate of Page? Call the Acting Prime Minister. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for Page for the question. Earlier today, I had the privilege of presenting the government's second annual report on infrastructure projects around Australia. It reported on our $50 billion commitment, the biggest in our nation's history, to build road and railway lines across the nation. And of course, uh, $14.9 billion of that investment is in New South Wales, <coughs> and one of the biggest projects, one of the most important projects in regional Australia is our $5.6 billion commitment towards the Pacific Highway. And uh, that work is now very much starting to focus in the members' electorate. Uh, so far, uh, 60 per cent, or 397 kilometres, has been upgraded to a four-lane uh, divided road, and there's construction on another 149 kilometres currently underway. And the first contract has been let for <coughs> 155 kilometres, the final section, uh, much of which is in the honourable member's electorate, uh, to complete that four-laning of the Pacific Highway. Now, Mr. Speaker, this could never have happened had Labor been in office. Uh, Labor, our commitment of $5.64 billion is $3 billion more than what Labor Member had committed Grain to the project, Labor. and once more, $2 billion of what Labor had proposed to provide was not available until after 2019 Member for Grain Not until after 1920. We're committed to finishing it before the end of this decade, and Labor would never have delivered on, on, on that formula. In addition to that, uh, Labor was demanding that New South Wales State Government pay 50 per cent of the cost. And earlier today, the Shadow Minister actually blamed the New South Wales State Government for because McMahon. Labor had underperformed on the Pacific Highway. Well, the reality is Labor was trying to change the formula so that the project would never be built. They had no commitment to the Pacific Highway. We've restored the 80-20 funding link. That's made the project possible, and that's why the, the people of New South Wales and indeed all of those travelling up the coast will have a four-lane highway all the way from Sydney to Brisbane before the end of this decade. The before the end of this decade, something Labor would never have delivered. Has the acting Prime Minister concluded his answer? Has the acting Prime Minister concluded his answer? The member for Grain will resume his seat. The member for Jagger Jagger has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. The Productivity Commission report released today recommends the family home be included in the pension assets test. Will the Treasurer give pensioners certainty in their retirement by ruling out including the family home in the pension assets test? Treasurer has the call. Thank member you, for Mr. Speaker. We'll I, thank the, I thank the member for the question. I note that the Productivity Commission report to which he refers to was a report to government, not from government, mm -hmm. and it was also a report that was initiated by the Productivity member Commission, Jagger Jagger not by the government. Question. The government's policy on this issue is very well known, and there is no change to the government's policy. The member for Reid. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question too is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on how Australia is transitioning from the mining boom to a more diversified economy? Is the Treasurer aware of any alternate plans that could hinder efforts to grow the economy and jobs and damage Australia's transition? The Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, I Thank the member for Reid for his question. Someone with a, a great <laughs> business record before coming into this House and well understands the challenges in the economy, and I commend him on his elevation to the role of chair of the House Committee on Economics, Mr. Speaker. Australia is steadily making the transition uh, from a once-in-a-generation mining investment boom, Mr. Speaker, to a more diversified economy. And as our economy continues to grow, as it, as it is, Mr Speaker, above the OECD average and, and more than twice the rate of comparable economies like Canada, who have also had a, a resource base, Mr Speaker, the sheer scale, though, of the, the resources booms means there will be challenges as we go through this transition. And Australians under, understand that, but they also are realistically optimistic about Australia's economic fortunes. And there have been very positive signs just in the course of the last <coughs> week, Mr Speaker, which gives them cause for confidence. Today, the Australian manufacturing sector has expanded for the fifth straight month in this, no this November. 
Now, that is the first time that's happened since July of 2010. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, the gross operating profit started this week was the first positive growth in profits recorded since March of 2014. This week's growth in wages and salaries over the past two years, two quarters, is the strongest since June of 2012. And of course, we've had the balance of payments started today, Mr. Speaker, which uh, the Minister for Trade will be very interested in because it shows that exports of goods and services in the September quarter rose by 4.6 per cent. That is the largest quarterly increase, Mr. Speaker, since 2000. Since 2000. This is a significant uh, improvement in our balance of payments when it comes to exports, Mr Speaker. And as those on this side of the House know, this government has been running the most ambitious trade agenda of any government, Mr Speaker, in recent memory, led, of course, by the Minister for Trade, as we have seen those uh, agreements come into place. Now, Mr Speaker, we have also seen employment continue to grow uh, over the past year. We have seen unemployment fall, particularly we have seen youth unemployment fall to a level now which is below it what, what it was at the time of the last election. Some 231,700 jobs created just in this year, Mr Speaker. That's the fastest growing calendar year growth in jobs since 2006, Mr Speaker. Now, what we will continue to do is work through the issues of growing our economy, growing jobs, Mr Speaker, as we move through this transition. Australians understand that our economy is in transition, and they know the things that they need to do and they are looking for a government and have found one, Mr Speaker, that will back them as they work and as they save and as they invest as they move through this transition in their economy. Now, Mr Speaker, there are alternative approaches like those put uh, by those opposite. This economy has had enough help from the opposition when they are in government of their very special brand of help, Mr Speaker. We have had far enough of that. This government is putting in place the strong platform for jobs and growth that our economy needs as we go through this transition. Just before I call the member for Jagger Jagger, I would like to inform the House that we have in the gallery this afternoon the winners of the My First Speech competition that we have just been with. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you all. The member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is to the Treasurer, and I refer to the Treasurer's previous answer. Given the Treasurer just ruled out including the family home in the pension assets test by affirming the government's policy will not change, why won't he also rule out increasing the GST to 15 per cent, which will push up the price of everything for pensioners? Before I, call the before I call the Treasurer, the member for Dobell will cease interjecting. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And as, uh, the government has the same position as the opposition when it comes to the matters to which uh, the member refers. And I am happy to confirm that our, our policy has not changed when it comes to the issue of uh, family homes, Mr Speaker, and nor should it. And this is something that I think is understood around this chamber. Now, the members opposite make reference to, to the goods and services tax. Now, Mr Speaker, again, we're going back to where we were a few weeks ago, where, where we were last week, Members Mr Speaker. Jagger, the government Jagger will has not no Check. such proposal has not put forward any such uh, preferred option or set of options, Mr Speaker. What the government has done has responded to the request from states and territories who have raised the issue of the issue of the GST. Now, the only other the only other group that I'm aware of in this parliament who has raised and had uh, modelling and assumptions worked out on a GST increase is the member for McMahon when he was the when he was the treasurer, Mr. Speaker, with the well-known scenario scenario three, Mr. Speaker. We're still uh, we're still waiting for the for the opposition to release and to give authority for the release of all the modelling that they did on an increase in the GST and an expansion of the GST. They they won't allow that information to be released, Mr. Speaker. And I would encourage I would encourage the shadow treasurer when he's not having a go at the member for Fowler, Mr. Speaker. He's a great bloke, the member for Fowler. He's a tremendous bloke. I can't understand why the member for McMahon would have so much against the son of a policeman. I think. He he has something against policemen, as we learned at the last election. Has the Treasurer concluded his answer? Has the Treasurer concluded his answer? The member for Sydney will cease interjecting. During that, the member for Chefley will cease interjecting. And through that answer, the member for Jagger Jagger continued to interject. I now warn her, and the, the Minister for Veterans Affairs will not interject.
The member for Melbourne has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. The government has already cut almost a billion dollars from clean energy and public good R&D and still plans to axe Australia's leading clean energy agencies, ARENA and the CEFC. If you really want us to believe the government has travelled down the road to Damascus on the way to Paris, instead of whipping out another $23 billion from clean energy research, development and investment, will you commit here and now to retaining the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and doubling their budgets? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm glad to see that the Greens and Labor are once again in, in very strong alliance on these issues, a, a very strong alliance between Greens and Labor when it comes to these issues, when it comes to economic policy, when it comes to how money should just be Members spent willy-nilly well off into the future. There's a strong bond between Labor and the Greens on these issues, an unbreakable bond, Mr. a bond which will never be broken, I suspect, Mr Speaker. But when it comes to the matters that the members has raised, Mr Speaker, the government's policy remains exactly as we have presented to the Senate and we have no plans to change that, Mr Speaker. What we have done is we have gone down the path of actually meeting our Kyoto Mark 1 targets. Australia has, is meeting those targets. It will meet that target, and we are going to that Member conference in Paris with a target Member of 26 to 28 per cent, which is a measured, responsible, calibrated response to the challenges that we face. Now, there is an alternative proposal, which I know the Greens would be very interested in, Mr. Speaker, and I suspect they wrote the crib notes for the opposition on what it should be, with a 45 per cent reduction in emissions. 45. 45% reduction in emissions. That's what those opposite are proposing, egged on by the Greens. Now, what we see from those opposite when we come to this, when it comes to the economy, some of us in, in this place will remember Pac-Man, the old computer game Pac-Man. The, the opposition and the Greens, when it comes to this issue, is like a Pac-Man just going around gobbling up jobs and gobbling up the economy and gobbling up the budget. And you know what happens at the end of Pac-Man? It's game over, and that's what it would be for the economy if you were ever let near it again. The member for O'Connor. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. <coughs> Will the minister update the House on developments at the Paris climate change meeting and what the government is bringing to the climate change negotiations? How does this compare with other proposed approaches? <coughs> the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, Member I thank for the Perth Member for O'Connor war. for his question. Overnight, the Prime Minister joined about 150 world leaders at the climate change meeting in Paris. Uh, they are all calling for a strong and effective global agreement to respond to the challenge of climate change and are seeking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions on a global basis. And the Prime Minister highlighted Australia's considerable economic effort in reducing our share of greenhouse gas emissions, while our contribution to global emissions is just over 1 per cent. Our 2030 target of a reduction of 26 to 28 per cent by 2030 is one of the biggest reductions by any G20 country. Indeed, as the Prime Minister said in his speech, uh, the speech to which the deputy leader referred, the Prime Minister said we will be reducing yeah, our emissions per capita by half. And as I've noted um, in previous answers, uh, that is a reduction uh, per unit of GDP of about two thirds. Uh, Recognising that innovation and technology will be essential to reducing emissions and driving economic growth, and of course the Prime Minister has put innovation at the heart of our policy agenda, the Prime Minister has announced that Australia will support the doubling of investment in clean energy innovation over the next five years. Further, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister also announced that Australia will ensure that at least a billion dollars over the next five years from our existing aid budget will help to reduce the impact of natural disasters in our region, prepare them for the risks of natural disaster because, of course, the Pacific, our part of the world, is one of the most natural disaster-prone regions in the world. And so, in consultation with development partners, particularly in the Pacific, we are taking practical steps which will um, strengthen our development programs with Pacific Island nations in particular, and that's why we're co-chairing the Green Climate Fund mm -hmm. to ensure that there's a 
focus on Pacific nations. Now, Mr. Speaker, the opposition, in contrast, continues in its desperate attempt to grab a headline. This reckless and ill-considered 45 per cent emissions target and 50 per cent renewable energy target. They won't give you any details on how they're going to do it because they know it means a supercharged carbon tax. The Climate Change Authority's analysis commissioned by Labor shows that Labor's 45 per cent reduction would wipe more than $600 billion off the economy. Employment, it would mean that employment by 2030 Member in the coal Child and gas industry objection. would be 23 per cent lower than otherwise. Jobs in the construction industry would be 11 per cent lower. And this Climate Change Authority analysis, commissioned by Labor, says the electricity sector would lose tens of thousands of jobs. Workers would lose jobs. And we know this because Professor Garneau said the carbon tax would lead to vulnerable, large-scale loss of livelihood. time has expired. Just before I call the, the member for McMahon, uh, can I inform the House we also have present uh, in the Southern Gallery to my left the winners of the Country to Canberra competition. Uh, on behalf of the uh, House, I pay them a very warm welcome, and I thank the member for Canberra for pointing that out. The member for McMahon. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer, and I refer to the Treasurer's answer earlier in question time, in which he talked about the economy but did not mention capital expenditure. How much did capital expenditure fall in the September quarter? How much has it fallen since the last election? I call the Treasurer. I now warn the member for Bass. Thanks, thanks, Mr Speaker. CapEx fell in that quarter by 9.2 per cent. And, and Mr Speaker, down by 9.2 per cent. Now, what I would say, and, it, and it's 20 per cent Member lower than it was a year ago. Him, Mr. Treasurer will just oh, I'm happy to take his interest. No, the Treasurer will resume his seat for a second. The member for McMahon's asked his question. He won't interject and he won't seek to ask supplementaries by way of interjection. The Treasurer has the call. And I, I know why the member opposite asked this question, Mr. Speaker, because mm. he seems to be in denial that Australia is actually moving past the investment phase of the mining boom. Now, the rest of the country. The rest of this side of the House understands that the Australian economy is going through a transition, and they will know that, um, that mining investment in this country has gone resources investment from about 8 per cent of GDP down to about 3 per cent of GDP. Now, that is what happens when you move out of the investment phase of a mining boom. Now, that might become news because those opposite seem to think that resources and mining was going to fuel um, their spending forever and ever and ever, and that's why they never do anything to curb spending, Mr Speaker. The Treasurer will resume his seat. The member for McMahon on a point of order. Mr Speaker, on direct relevance, the Treasurer appears unaware that non-mining investment is down as well. The member will resume his seat. There is no point of order. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. The Speaker. member for Herbert will cease interjecting. And look, the, the member the, for Herbert. The, the, the shadow the Treasurer is right to point out that non-mining investment oh. also fell. Mr. Speaker. What he also does not understand is that when an economy transitions, is the investment follows the demand. And what, we, what I outlined in my earlier answer, if he, if he chose to listen, is what we're seeing is a pickup in the demand side of the economy, Mr. Speaker. And what we will see as the economy transition is the investment side of the equation. Currently, what we're seeing is them picking up and utilising existing capacity. And they're moving into that existing capacity as the demand picks up and as we continue to support policies that promote growth and jobs, then investment will follow at a later stage. Now, that's what happens when an economy transitions. Now, those opposite may used to pick out simple points of data to engage in their, in their, in their pessimistic view of the Australian economy, Mr Speaker. They may, they may wish to do that. But the good news is, is the majority of Australians are— Member for McMahon. The majority of Australians, Mr. Speaker, are confident about our economy, and there are more optimists than there are pessimists in, about the Australian economy, according to the Westpac Melbourne Institute survey, Mr. Speaker. Now, those opposite may want to indulge in their parade of pessimism when it comes to the economy, Mr. Speaker, but the Australian people are going to be backed by this government because they're out there working and saving and investing, and we are going to back them to do that. Those opposite, Mr. Speaker, are going to simply seek to discourage them, and that's why they do not deserve to sit on this side of the House. The member for Lyne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Paramount. My question is to the Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science. I remind the Minister that the Business Council of Australia today released a report on, the compa on Australia's competitive comparative advantage in the agri-food sector. Will the, minister, will the minister outline to the House how the government's actions in innovations and science 
will help drive paddock to plate productivity and help drive growth in regional Australia. The Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am very pleased to get a question from the member for Lyne about the Business Council of Australia's report today, uh, which they handed down, Building Australia's Comparative Advantages, a 21st century agri-food sector, <coughs> because his electorate of Lyne has a very diverse economy. It encompasses agriculture, food manufacturing, uh, mining, uh, as well as uh, industry and advanced manufacturing. And the Business Council of Australia the Business Council of they're always dealing with the big issues, Mr. Speaker, aren't they? They're always dealing with the big issues on the other side of the House. Focusing on my tie uh, is apparently the big issue for the Treasurer. <coughs> Apart from replacing a member for Fowler, the other issue he's concerned about is whether my tie is a Hogwarts tie, Mr. Speaker. I can assure you it's not, it's a Cosmos Club tie from Washington, D.C. <laughs> now, Mr. Speaker, back to the uh, important question I was asked by the member for Lyme. The Business Council of Australia's agribusiness report today was the first of their five deep dives on the economy uh, that the Business Council of Australia have promised to do. It's a very interesting document. And in it, Jennifer Westacott says one of the important things is realising the opportunity requires a shift in mindset and approach from government and industry. Policies need to shift from a focus on agriculture alone to one that encompasses the broader agri-food sector. And that is why uh, member for Flynn and the rest of the House, the government is focusing on a national innovation and science agenda that will be released next week that will have great advantages to the agribusiness sector. It will help to drive businesses like swarm farming and forager foods in Tasmania, forager foods in the member for Lyons electorate, swarm farming in the member for Flynn's electorate. These are businesses that are using new technologies to drive jobs and growth in the Australian economy in, the rural, in rural and regional Australia. And all four themes in the National Innovation and Science Agenda, whether it's culture and capital, the governments as an exemplar, talents and skills and collaboration, will have big impacts in rural and regional Australia. Take collaboration for just one example. We already support rural research and development corporations, ag-focused competitive research centres, which have been very successful in the CRC on pork, for example. As the minister would know, the Minister for Agriculture will soon form a limited company as they, the next iteration of its existence. CSRO has a dedicated agriculture business unit. Lots of aspects of the National Innovation and Science Agenda will help to turbocharge that part of the economy in agriculture and mining and food manufacturing right across uh, uh, rural and regional Australia. So I'm very much looking forward to it, as I'm sure is the rest of the House. And I welcome the Business Council's support of the government working to diversify the economy. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Justice. When was the Minister for Justice or his office first informed of the Australian Federal Police's intention to execute a search warrant at the home of the Special Minister of State? The Minister for Justice. Well, I don't need to be careful. Thank you for the question. Um, as is usual practice, the Australian Federal Police informed me just prior to it being executed. The member for Solomon. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources. Will the Minister update the House on how agriculture is supporting both jobs and innovation in the Northern Territory and right across the nation more broadly? And how is this helping to boost the Australian economy? The Minister for Agriculture. The member for Grainler will cease interjecting. The Minister for Agriculture. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for a question. Uh, and she, more than most, would understand the improvements that are happening in agriculture by reason of innovation. She would know because of the work that she herself has done in the IT sector over a long period of time. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's great to see that in the Northern Territory, in some instances, at the forefront of the innovation sector. Uh, Australian Agricultural Company has recently opened a new abattoir, and it's great to see that uh, the Australian Agricultural Company has had a massive turnaround in their profits. Member 350, for 350 new jobs in that area, and it's great to see Member that uh, in warned. the six months to September, they had a $50 million profit, and that compares to a $3.59 million loss in the prior corresponding period. 
Uh, Mr Speaker, this is the first profit they've had since 2007, and just goes to show the turnaround in the agricultural sector and how this is inspiring jobs and how it's uh, bringing about a better outcome and a better standard of living for people in the Territory. But it's not just in the Territory, Mr Speaker, it's also in South Australia with companies such as Thomas Food, which uh, has an annual revenue of $1.3 billion, $1 billion a year and employs 2,500 people. Uh, the benefits from this is now even seen in my electorate in, in, uh, in Tamworth, where their expansion is going to bring about another 200 jobs. This is happening all across our nation, Mr. Speaker, and uh, in innovation goes hand in hand with new jobs. This morning I read, Mr. Speaker, about the uh, upgrade and the innovation by Sterilec, uh, which is gamma irradiation of mangoes, and this is allowing the export of a new product into the United States further ex expanding our capacity to export this product from all around South East Queensland, where the uh, Acting Prime Minister is obviously very aware of the issues there. Robotics has also come to the, to the fore, and we know about um, the robotics that the, um, the, 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 the Minister for Innovation has been speaking about today, and how these robotics in, in modular units are being used for the control of weeds and for the more effective delivery of, uh, of chemical to land. Whether it's also in uh, the extension of, of drones and how they're dealing with weed control, and let's not forget the massive investment, the massive investment that the federal government itself gives every year, quarter of a billion dollars in the ag portfolio alone in matching R&D funding, water upgrades as part of the excess of 12 billion dollars that has been spent on the Murray-Darling Basin to get a more effective delivery of water and to get a better return from their unit of land. And even in the last week, uh, Mr. Speaker, I had the, the pleasure of, um, of, of uh, releasing a new grass, a tall fescue, and its name, unsurprisingly enough, was Barnaby. <laughs> the member for Isaacs. Members on my left. Members on my left. The, mem the member for Isaacs is seeking the call. Member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Justice. Given the minister was informed of the Australian Federal Police's intention to execute a search warrant at the home of the Special Minister of State, did the minister or his office inform any of his ministerial colleagues, including but not limited to the Prime Minister, the Attorney General, the Special Minister of State, other ministers or any of their respective offices? The Minister for Justice. Yeah. Member for Sydney won't interject. Thank you Member very for Jagger much, Jagger Mr. is now warned. The, the minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, after the warrants were executed, as I would normally do in a matter like this, I informed the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff and the Attorney General as the Cabinet Minister in the portfolio. The member for Macquarie. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Will the minister outline to the House how the government is helping our Pacific neighbours respond to the challenges posed by climate change? The Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Member for Kingston. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And can I thank uh, the member for Macquarie for her interest in this? Uh, the fact is, Mr Speaker, that there are actually uh, a number of our Pacific Island families but of course face real challenges as a consequence of climate change. In particular, we know that Vanuatu, Tonga, Solomon Islands and PNG are among the top 10, are among the top 10 of the world's most at-risk countries when it comes to natural disasters. So in this respect, Australia is playing a very important role, I'm happy to inform the member from Macquarie, when it comes to helping our Pacific neighbours. Uh, we know, for example, that we're going to take responsible action in relation to climate change. Because under the coalition government, the target that we've taken to Paris represents a 50 per cent per capita reduction. This reinforces the strong message that Australia has that we stand shoulder to shoulder with the Pacific Island family when it comes to taking action that's responsible and consistent with their needs. And that's why I was so pleased, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister announced overnight $1 billion that's going towards helping to boost climate resilience projects in Smith. vulnerable countries, particularly those in the Pacific. And Australia is going to continue to work with a number of our program partners in Kingston terms Smith of delivery of these programs, Mr. Speaker. The Green Climate Fund, 
World Member Development for Bank, is now warned. Asian Development Bank are just some examples of who we'll be working with. But in this role, Mr. Speaker, since I've served as the Minister for International Development in the Pacific, I've had the opportunity to see on the ground action that Australia is taking together with program partners to help bring about resilience and change in the Pacific. For example, in Niue, I had the opportunity to visit and launch a state-of-the-art tidal gauge facility. This is going to play a critical role in providing scientific information, real-time measurements to not only Niue's National Weather Service but also to the knowledge base that we have in Australia. Uh, in Fiji's Yasawa Islands, a remote chain of drought-prone um, a rem a remote chain of drought-prone islands, we're seeing a community food bank project that's helping to produce resilient crops and to improve farming techniques. In Kiribati, we're seeing Australia's programs that are working together with the local community to protect fresh water supplies, Member to rehabilitate Sydney. the seawall, and to assist communities to respond to droughts. Member for Sydney will we're cease also making sure that our investments are resilient, because we're making sure that the infrastructure we build is resilient to climate change, whether it be roads, ports or bridges. The fact is the coalition has a strong investment plan to help boost our region, and it stands in contrast to a Labor opposition that don't know where they stand, whether they are in favour of an emissions trading scheme but then withdraw it, whether or not they were whipping funds out of, for example, funding for Kiribati and the Marshall Islands, 30 per cent from the Marshall Islands, 20 per cent from Kiribati. The difference could not be more stark. Just before I call the member for Isaacs, we've, I informed the House we've just had join us in the last few minutes an Indonesian parliamentary delegation led by His Excellency Mr Erman Guzman, Speaker of the House of Regional Representatives Council. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you all. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Special Minister of State. On Thursday last week, during question time, the minister said, quote, I refer you to the findings of the full bench of the federal court, which dealt with all of the evidence put before it and found entirely that I acted appropriately. I've read that judgment from beginning to end, including paragraphs 122 to 124. Can the minister name the paragraph which he finds acted appropriately? If there isn't one, hasn't the minister misled the parliament? The member for Dawson will cease interjecting. Members on my right will contain themselves. I need to hear the question. I just heard the question, and I remind those on my left. The member for Melbourne Ports is warned. The minister has the call. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Um, just to help the honourable member, this is what the full bench of the federal court judgment says. And I quote: "We are of the opinion that there was no basis." for the primary judge to conclude that Bruff was part of any combination with anyone to the commencement of these proceedings with the predominant purpose of damaging Slipper in the way alleged or at all. Furthermore, Member for Grindler. Furthermore, well, the minister resume his seat. Minister resume his seat. I made clear in earlier answers I'm going to deal very strongly with interjections on questions where the opposition is seeking to follow up on previous answers. I need to hear the answer. If anyone interjects in the minister's answer, I'm going to eject them. The minister has the call. Thank you again, Mr Speaker. And I conclude by continuing with the findings of the full bench of the federal court. Despite Bruff's hesitation at seeing Ashby, he did so and referred him to Russell QC. There is absolutely nothing untoward about these matters. I call the member for Bass. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question call. is to the Treasurer. On the 20th of November, I spoke at a well-attended forum in Launceston convened by the Association of Independent Retirees. Strong concerns were expressed at that meeting at the possibility of unexpected or retrospective changes to superannuation. Will the Treasurer outline the government's approach to superannuation? And is he aware of uh, any policy risks to the hard-won superannuation savings of everyday Australians? Call the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, being a member for Kingston, those of us on call. this side of the House understand and, and acknowledge the contribution made by Australians who have worked their whole lives for one 
particular purpose, and that is so they can become a self-funded retiree. Correct. Becoming a self-funded retiree, an independent retiree, not dependent on government payments and things like this, Mr. Speaker, to get with home ownership is one of the great aspirations of Australians. And these are the things, Mr. Speaker, that we want to continue to encourage as a government. We also know, Mr Speaker, that the pension is there for those who, because of whatever circumstances in life, have been unable to get themselves in a position of being fully independent in retirement. It's an important payment. It has to be a sustainable payment. The government has no plans to make any changes to the pension. Mr Speaker. Those matters were dealt with earlier this year when we ensured that those most vulnerable pensioners, Mr Speaker, those with the lowest level of assets, would be getting an increase in the pension, Mr Speaker, something those opposite actually voted against. Now, when it comes to superannuation, it is important that we understand there must be stability and certainty. Now, those opposite aren't wrote the book on creating instability and uncertainty when it came to superannuation during their time in government, Mr Speaker, where they saw the superannuation savings of Australians as a plaything for unions, Mr Speaker. This, side, this side of the House will not do that. This side of the House is focused on building a better superannuation system which encourages Australians and backs Australians to be independent in their retirement. Now that means, Mr Speaker, there needs to be greater choice. Greater choice. There needs to be better governance. And we note that those opposite still resist to this day and oppose the idea of Member better governance of superannuation <clears throat> funds. They don't want independence in the government super, superannuation funds, Mr Speaker. What they want is unions to control workers' money, Mr Speaker. That's what they want. On this side of the House, we think there should be choice. Member we think Gordon, there should be there better governance. We think there should be better information. Because we know, Mr Speaker, when we talk about superannuation, we're trying to help Australians be independent in their retirement. What they're Member simply doing, Mr warned. Speaker, when it comes to superannuation, is they just see a big bag of cash that they want to tax so they can <coughs> chase higher and higher and higher levels of spending, Mr Speaker. On this side, we are interested in providing certainty for retirement and certainty and stability, which ensures that those who have saved and invested over their lifetime aren't subjected to the uncertainties of what might happen in the retirement phase, which those opposite, Mr Speaker, I note, want to crash the party when it comes to people in the retirement phase, and they've made that pretty clear. Mr Speaker, when it comes to superannuation, we want to help and support and back Australians who are seeking to reach that aspiration of being a self-funded retiree. And for those who can't get to that level, Mr Speaker, we will ensure through our strong fiscal management that the pension will always be there for them. Just before I call the member for Isaacs, the member for Hotham I've warned on numerous days and a number of times. She continued to interject in that answer. If she interject, interjects again, uh, she'll be ejected from the chamber. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is again to the Special Minister of State. If the federal court judgment found that the minister acted appropriately, why did the Australian Federal Police raid his home? The members on my right will cease interjecting. Members on my right will cease interjecting. I'm ruling the question out of order. It's, it's asking the minister to answer for somebody else. I'm going to call the member for uh, Lyons. Indeed, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. As the Minister is aware, I've been campaigning on behalf of Mr. Phil Reader, a constituent in my electorate of Lyons, and others for the legalisation of low THC industrial hemp grown in Australia to be approved for human consumption. The benefits of such, ch such changes for Tasmanian farmers is considered significant. Imported hemp food products are currently available, however, the Australian grown equivalents are not. Can the minister please provide an update on the recent Ministerial Advisory Council meeting deliberations and the decision-making process required to see industrial hemp approved for human consumption in Australia? Call the Minister for Health. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the member for Lyons for his question? I well remember, member for Lyons, a meeting I had with you when you were a candidate at Deloraine with some very feisty vegetable growers. The acting Prime Minister might remember that group as well. And, um, I'm pleased to say that here in this House your energy and enthusiasm that I saw on that day is undiminished. Uh, Mr Speaker, at the recent meeting of the Australia and New Zealand Ministerial Forum on Food Regulation, members discussed a progress report on work being undertaken to address information gaps relating to concerns with adopting low THC hemp as a food. 
Uh, as the member would be aware, there are several studies currently being undertaken, commissioned by the Food Forum, which seek to address the gaps in information. The studies centre around matters such as labelling, distribution, legal and treaty issues and, in particular, law enforcement matters. The law enforcement study will consider, for example, if you are pulled up for roadside testing, having consumed low THC hemp in food, uh, what that might mean. Uh, it's expected that all but one of the studies will be completed in time for the Forum on Food Regulations meeting early next year. However, the law enforcement study is very complex and will take until later next year. So, in the absence of any major issues arising from the other studies, the Forum and our regulatory agency, Food Standards Australia New Zealand, FASANS, can begin preparing the necessary changes to regulations so that if the law enforcement study Members ticks all the appropriate boxes, the government can Members move swiftly to make the necessary regulatory changes. Now, I um, you know, report that in quite detail, uh, Mr. Speaker, because it is specific. Uh, it does involve a forum where the Commonwealth has one vote, every state in Australia has one vote, New Zealand has one vote, and decisions are made as a group. So it's not something that we can, if you like, wave a magic wand and get happening. But I really do applaud the member for Lyons' enthusiasm in this area to provide broad, a broader economic base for the agricultural constituents in his region and for the rural economy in Tasmania more generally. So uh, I will keep him up to date and again I commend him on his advocacy. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Special Minister of State. I refer to the Minister's previous answer. Isn't it true that the federal court judgment was handed down before the Minister admitted on national television to procuring copies of the former Speaker's official diary? By claiming the judgment exonerated him, hasn't the minister misled the parliament? The member for Joe Bell has been warned. The minister has the call. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. I had two things for the member's uh, advice. One, um, in relation to the 60 Minutes interview. What was put to air was not the full question. Secondly, let me reiterate again what the full bench had to say, just in case in your lengthy reading you missed it. We are of the opinion that there was no basis for the primary judge to conclude that Brock was part of any combination with anyone to commence to the commencement of these proceedings with the predominant purposes Member of for damaging will leave under 94A. The in a way alleged or at all. Further, despite Brough's hesitation at seeing Ashby, he did so and referred him to Russell QC. There is absolutely nothing untoward about these matters. Do go on in your year of ideas. The member for Patterson. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, representing the Minister for Defence. Minister, will you update the House on what the Coalition Government is doing to contain the PFOS firefighting chemical contamination at Williamtown RAF base. What actions has this government taken so far and what plans are in place to restore the livelihood, the lifestyle of my constituents affected by the PFOS contamination? I call the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Patterson for this question and note his uh, concern for his constituents in relation to this matter. I'm advised that Defence is taking this issue of contamination at RAAF Base Williamtown very seriously. Surface and groundwater contamination has been detected in and around the base as a result of past use of firefighting chemicals. The products have been used in firefighting for decades in every major military base and civilian airport, not just in Australia but internationally. So this is a worldwide issue, as the member knows. The land at Williamtown is generally low and flat, and the water table is very close to the surface, only half a metre down in some places unadvised, presenting significant challenges to containing these chemicals. Through worldwide and Australian research, it transpires that there are few effective or viable large-scale remediation techniques other than incineration of contaminated soil have been identified. So incineration is an option that Defence is examining, and I'm advised that the Minister for Defence met with officials about this in Canberra last week. 
I am also advised that Defence is undertaking a range of control measures, including a rigorous testing regime, and I know Defence are happy to provide the member with details. Um, for example, to ensure that people have access to safe drinking water, to date Defence have visited 170 properties, uh, tested about 186 private bores, 139 rainwater tanks and 17 swimming pools. I'm also advised that the Department of Human Services has processed claims and paid about $155,000 uh, for financial assistance to claimants uh, to date. Um, Mr. Speaker, in addition, the New South Wales government has applied bans on commercial fishing in Fullerton Cove and Upper Tillagery Creek since September. The federal government has implemented um, a financial assistance package of up to $25,000 uh, per commercial fisher who derives the majority of their income from those areas. So we are working with the New South Wales government in that regard. Mr Speaker, there will be a Senate inquiry into this contamination at RAAF Base Williamtown, and uh, Defence will continue to work with federal and state and local authorities to appreciate the full scope of this issue at Williamtown and future remediation options. The Senate inquiry will also look at other Commonwealth, state and territory sites. The government fully supports this inquiry, and we look forward to Defence uh, full participation and cooperation with the Senate inquiry, and I trust that that answers the member's question. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again to the Special Minister of State. Yesterday and today, the minister has referred to paragraphs 122 to 124 of the full federal court's judgment in the matter of Ashby and Slipper. Paragraph 124 states that the minister was, and I quote, the recipient of copies of some of Slipper's diary entries. Given that even the judgment the minister mistakenly clings to as some sort of defence finds that he received copies of the Speaker's Members official right. diary, isn't it time the minister resigned? Yeah. The minister, the member for Braddon is warned. The member for Karangamite is warned. The minister has the call. Mr. Speaker, a truly remarkable statement from a QC, clinging to the judgment of the full bench. How pathetic of me. Did you read the rest of that paragraph which said there was nothing inappropriate about me having any diary notes? Or has that slipped your memory? The member, members on my left, the member for MacArthur has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. How are the opportunities provided by Australia's free trade agreements helping to promote jobs and growth at companies such as A2 Milk and Smeaton Grange in my electorate of MacArthur. The Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, I thank the member for MacArthur for his question. And I enjoyed being out there with him at Smeaton Grange at A2 Milk, a great Australian success story, albeit maybe first born in New Zealand, but came here and experienced spectacular growth, Mr Speaker. And it's a very visionary company. And I was very pleased to be invited to go and join the member for MacArthur because it shows the tangible benefit of the extraordinary free trade agreements that have been negotiated by the Minister for Trade. And it shows and demonstrates how this government's strong plan, strong national platform for growth and jobs, is delivering on the ground, particularly in southwestern Sydney and all around the country. This is a company that, since the negotiation of the free trade agreement with China, has put on a full extra shift a full extra shift out there in Campbelltown, Mr Speaker. And people are coming predominantly from the local area and getting those jobs, which comes from exporting Australian milk produced locally and out at, uh, out at uh, Dubbo, I think, so out at, at, uh, at Forbes, um, where the milk and the cows are, are producing the milk, Mr Speaker, and that's coming and in the surrounding area of southwestern Sydney. And this milk is on its way to China. And uh, I'm sure that the announcement of the end of the uh, one-child policy in China is also going to do wonderful things for the sale of infant formula and things of that nature to China as well. But that's an opportunity that is going to be able to be realised because of the extra extraordinary work of the Minister for Trade and a government that is committed to expanding our trade frontiers, a government that understands that we're a country that needs to earn more, that needs to earn our way, that we won't have the opportunity of the high commodity prices that, and the investment boom in, in, in the mining sector, Mr Speaker, uh, to, to uh, carry us in the years ahead. And so every inch will have to be won. And the Australian people know this. And uh, Jeff Babbage out 
at A2 Milk understands this, Mr. Speaker. And I'm pleased to report to the House, Mr. Speaker, the Reserve Bank also understands it, because while we've been here in question time, I note that they've decided to keep uh, the cash rate at the same level, Mr. Speaker. And in their commentary, they say that uh, the available information suggests that moderate expansion in the economy continues to face a large decline in capital spending in the mining sector. This has been accompanied by stronger growth in employment and a steady rate uh, of unemployment. And they go on to say, Mr Speaker, the board again judged that the prospects for an improvement in economic conditions has firmed, Mr Speaker. And the reason they firmed is because of the outstanding work that is being done by people like Jeff Babbage, who are out there working hard, investing, setting themselves up in China. Seven staff they had they put up there into China to ensure that they could seize the opportunity. And when the opportunity came, courtesy of the Minister for Trade, they are in there, Mr Speaker. They are in there, they are securing those markets, and that is securing jobs jobs for young Australians, Australians of all ages out in southwestern Sydney and all around the all around the country. And his colleagues from Tasmania and other parts of the country, Mr Speaker, will know that the improvement in trade conditions, particularly for China, for dairy products, is, is one of the great things that this government has been able to achieve and uh, is going to secure future employment prospects for Australians all around the country, but particularly the in the member for McCarthy for in Southwest has Sydney. Sydney. Expired. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Special Minister of State. I refer to the Minister's previous answers, and I refer to comments made by James Ashby in today's Australian, and I quote, So I went home and pulled a copy of the diary out of my cupboard, took some pictures of the relevant dates, and sent them to Mal. He couldn't read them and texted me and asked if I could send them again. Did the Minister receive those unauthorised copies of the former Speaker's diary? Is conduct of this nature consistent with the standard this government applies to the minister's portfolio? The minister has the call. Thanks again, Mr. Speaker, uh, and again for the, the shadow minister's. Um, I'm not quite sure what. Um, contemplation is that you uh, ask the, um, the question is that. Did I receive uh, any further correspondence of any kind from Mr Ashby? The answer is no. Uh, the member for Isaacs is Call warned. it whatever you like. Um, so, Mr. Deputy, Mr Speaker, I say to the uh, Shadow Attorney-General, I referred him to a radio interview today uh, on 2GB between Alan Jones and Mr James Ashby, where Mr Jones asked, did Mel Brough ever ask you for copies of Slipper's diaries? No. The member for Benelong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Will the Minister update the House on action the government is taking to ensure the safe passage of holiday makers and Christmas cargo over the Christmas period? Is the Minister aware of anyone planning to stall the country's Christmas cargo, Santa, his reindeers and many helpers, and ruin the festive period for many Australians? The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. <laughs> I'm not going to give him an entry permit. <laughs> I thank uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member very much uh, for his question. I wasn't aware he's going to include all of that in his preamble, but he uh, <laughs> he's going to attend, as I understand, the Rotary Carols at uh, North Ride Common, which is the second largest carols event in Sydney, expecting 15,000 attendees. Member for so, Griffith. Well done, member. He's a great local member. The member for Benelong now. Mr Speaker, as uh, every Australian knows, uh, of course, over Christmas uh, there will be three and a half million border crossings and over three million cargo consignments. Uh, it is a very busy period for the Australian Border Force staff and they do great work on a daily basis to keep our country safe. But uh, there is a problem. There is a problem because I understand even though there is going to be an increase of uh, staff uh, to cope with the uh, increased numbers, particularly at international airports. Uh, the CPSU, uh, who is no friend of uh, families this Christmas, uh, is planning on industrial action to target cargo and freight, including ports, air freight terminals and international mail centres. Now we hear the objections uh, from the Sea of Union bosses opposite, uh, because they are, here. they are here as puppets of the union bosses uh, around the country, which again gives uh, another rise. And now the fact is, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, we've seen Members examples of union leaders putting their hands into the pockets of Australians before, and in the past, uh, Craig Thompson was one such example where 
He used credit cards and the fees that uh, had been paid by good hard-working union members. But there is a new approach by the CPSU this Christmas. Not only are they going to say to Australians that you are going to have a delay in receiving your Christmas package, but they are asking for this to be paid for by crowdfunding so that their members can be back paid uh, for stopping the free passage of the cargo. Now, this is a pretty unique approach, but we would expect it from the CPSU. Imagine asking Australians to crowdfund union activity which is going to stop Christmas presents flowing across the country. And it shows how out of touch the CPSU is with the Australian public. It shows how out of touch the current Labor Party is uh, with the Australian public. And it demonstrates, it demonstrates Mr Speaker, how at this Christmas the CPSU and the union leaders across this country will once again do the wrong thing by the Australian public. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Special Minister of State. I refer to the Minister's previous answer, where he claimed that he did not request a copy of the Speaker's diary. Uh, when he sent a text to James Ashby in 2012, which read, Can that be emailed, James? It is hard to read. Malbruff2 at bigpond.com. <laughs> if he wasn't asking for the diary, what on earth is the Parliament to think that he was asking for? <laughs> I remind members on both sides before I call the minister, the member for Chifley. Before I call the minister, I remind members on both sides. I will deal with interjections. The minister has the call. Thanks again, Mr. Speaker. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday. Same questions. I ask. The, uh, I ask you the question, the uh, Shadow Attorney General. Have you been able to ascertain one the skerrick of evidence at will all? will resume his seat. The member for Grindler on a point of yes, order. Yes, point of order. This is a very specific no, point, question point of order. on relevance, Mr Speaker. A very specific the, the question. The member for Grindler will resume his seat. What? The member for Grindler will resume his seat. The minister's 15 seconds into the answer. Now, I warn members on both sides. The Leader of the House, the, the Minister hasn't got the call. I'm warning members on both sides, do not interject, do not interject while I'm making a ruling. The Minister has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, despite the best efforts of the opposition, they have not put one thing forward that was not already in the federal court, that has been dealt with by the federal court. I stand by all of my actions as being entirely appropriate, entirely honest. The member for Hughes. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My constituency question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. The Enfield Intermodal, once described as a test case for the viability of an intermodal at Moorbank, is now years overdue with the operator pulling out. And with competitors planning intracity intermodals in superior locations, including Shalora, Billawood and St Mary's, isn't there a grave risk that the government investment in a proposed intermodal at Moorbank is destined to be a white elephant? The acting Prime Minister. I thank the honourable member for his for his question, uh, and as he he has been a strong advocate for his community and has spoken out on numerous occasions about community issues associated with the construction of the Moorbank Terminal, in particular issues like noise and, and traffic. But I can assure the honourable member that I am confident that this is a sound project. It has been a project that has been supported by both sides of politics. Indeed, the, the initial agreement to build this uh, terminal was actually signed by John Anderson and Craig Knowles, so it goes back a very long time. Now, there's been a number of iterations of the, various, of the proposal, uh, and what has happened now under this government is that uh, our intermodal uh, terminal, uh, uh, terminal company has come to an agreement with, um, with, with uh, SITMA. Uh, to, with the view to jointly building an intermodal terminal on their land and on the um, defence land that adjoins it. Now, this will be a very substantial facility. It will be connected to the Port of Botany by rail and indeed connected to the, the interstate rail network uh, so that it can be a real distribution point and a very important hub for business investment in, in Sydney. 
Uh, it's estimated there will be about 1,300 jobs involved in the construction and over 7,000 jobs once the facility is in place. Now, uh, the, the planning for the proposal does involve uh, careful consideration of environmental issues, uh, dealing with uh, the concerns of the community. Uh, but it will also look at uh, how to best move, uh, move freight in and out of this facility and address the concerns that the local community has. Uh, because of the way in which we put together this deal, the commitment uh, and, and involvement of the Australian taxpayers has been substantially reduced and we're confident that it will return good rewards uh, as a business proposition to the Australian government, but most importantly that it will be a key hub for the creation of jobs in the members' electorate and indeed in other parts uh, surrounding uh, it in, in, in Sydney. I think this is an innovative project. It's being funded in an innovative way. It's a good example of cooperation between the private sector and the public sector, and there is a real awareness of the importance of making sure that this major new facility is also a good local citizen, that they work with their community to make sure that uh, the jobs that are created are not at the cost of the lifestyle of the people who live in that region. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Special Minister of State. I refer to the Minister's previous answers. And I refer to reports in today's Australian that the Assistant Minister for Innovation provided James Ashby with a sheet of paper which included instructions to obtain a copy of the former Speaker's diary. The Australian reports, and I quote, Mr Ashby said his lawyers had the sheet of paper and it would undoubtedly have Wyatt's fingerprints on it. Is conduct of this nature consistent with the standard this government apply? The minister has the call. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm aware of the media reports, and uh, I have nothing further to add. The member for Brisbane. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, constituency question. My constituency question is to the Acting Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Thousands of my constituents in the electorate of Brisbane spend their mornings stuck in traffic along Kingsford Smith Drive, and they're waiting long periods of time uh, to move a very short distance. Could the minister please outline how the Kingsford Smith Drive upgrade partly funded by this government, will benefit the locals in my electorate of Brisbane, and are there any obstacles standing in the way of this vital piece of infrastructure? I call the Acting Prime Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for her question. And I refer again to the statement I made earlier uh, today in relation to the government's $50 billion infrastructure program, which, uh, amongst its uh, broad range of measures includes $13 billion worth of projects in Queensland, uh, including some very substantial projects like the Gateway North upgrade, which uh, is being funded and under constructed now by, the, by this government. The previous government had said that they would build this project, but only if it was told. Only if it was told. And they knew that it wasn't possible for it to be told. So in practice, it was one of the, the, the opposite side's empty promises in relation to infrastructure construction. Now, I, I appreciate the, the issues that the honourable member has raised. Kingsford Smith Drive is a very attractive entrance to Brisbane, but in peak hours in particular it's choked with traffic. And so the initiative of the Brisbane City Council to spend about $600 million on upgrading the Kingsford Smith Drive is certainly commendable. What is, of course, alarming, what of course is alarming, uh, particularly following uh, the, the experience in Victoria. Where the, when Labor was elected to office, they immediately moved to cancel the East-West project. And now we have complaints that Victoria is not getting its share of the road funding. They're not getting their share because they cancelled the most important project. The most important project. So even though the contracts have been signed, even though the contracts have been signed, Labor ripped them up and, and uh, threw them away. Now you would have think that Labor would have learned from that lesson. The way roadworks and construction has stalled in Victoria as a result of that precipitous action. But lo and behold, the Labor candidate for Lord Mayor in Brisbane is actually proposing to rip up the contracts for the Kingsford Smith Drive upgrade if he was elected. 
Now, rip up the contract, a contract already signed but with Lend-Lease to build this project, but Labor says, in true Labor style, following on the lead from Premier Andrews in Victoria, they will rip up Member the contract for Griffith. and the project won't Member be built. For so just like in Victoria, where hundreds of millions of dollars of compensation had to be paid to those whose work, whose work was being taken away from them, also in Brisbane. How much compensation will the ratepayers of Brisbane have to pay because the Labor Party intends Member to rip up this contract? Now, fortunately, Labor is not likely to win the, the council election in Victoria. Sorry, in Brisbane. In Brisbane, but nobody Member thought they were going to win government we'll in Victoria cease interjecting. either. The reality is that this is a vital project for, for Queensland, a vital project for Brisbane, and it cannot afford to have a Labor government that's going to tear up the contract. To tear up the contract. Mr Speaker, with those comments, can I uh, move the further questions to be placed on the notice paper? After 54 questions in two days, I think that's a pretty good effort. I thank the Acting Prime Minister.